the Father will give you. This is my command. Love each other. So, I don't know if you've noticed. You, have you all noticed that sometimes life seems like it's a battle between the good and the evil of the time? Have you ever noticed that? There's good and there's evil. So let, let's practice that, that. Repeat after me. There's good and there's evil. And I'm not saying that this side of the room is good and this side of the room is evil. That is up to your own interpretation. I know some of you are looking at the room going, I know them over there better than the preacher does. Isn't it true? I got that right. I like it when the preacher gets it right just once. Now, I'm going to tell you, I'm really excited to be starting this third section of what the church is called to be. Remember, we, we, we talked about right after I got here how the church is called to be the worshiping church, and that's how we love God. And then we talked during the month of February, we talked about how we're called to be the compassionate church, and that's how we love one another. So today I'm going to talk about the third leg of this, this church picture that we have here, and that is we are called to be the praying church. Now, if I said, does First Christian Church pray? You would say, well, of course, haven't you been paying attention? We prayed the Lord's Prayer. The pastor prayed. He prayed before, in between songs. The elder prayed, you know, before communion. Of course, we're a praying church, right? right. And some of you even take it even further. When you, when you go home today for lunch, you'll stop and pray the blessing on the meal, or, or <coughs> you'll give thanks for lunch, or, and you'll ask that the hands that prepared the food would be blessed and all those things, right? How many of you will do that today? So, you know, and maybe you even will pray before you go to bed and, and you'll, you'll pray with your children or grandchildren and all of that's wonderful. But, but I have to tell you that sometimes I think, and I wonder if you don't think the same way, that sometimes prayer just seems kind of <sighs> maybe you ever feel that way you, you, you offer up those prayers and it seems like they just kind of bounce off the side <coughs> you know how about if I take that for you for this you know since, since I know where the scripture goes and, and, and where the pictures go but you were following along really well I know and she doesn't have anything really to follow along <laughs> But, you know, so we, 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 we've really been called as a church to not just pray, but to be people of extreme prayer. Now, how many of you like that word extreme? There's extreme sports, and there's extreme this, and, and usually when we use that word and we talk about people, it's usually not a favorable thing. You know, one of the words that we could have used there is maybe, how about being a fanatical prayer? And they go, oh no, I'm not going to be a fanatic. Just the people next to me need to be fanatics. That's right. <coughs> so, I want to talk about this idea of extreme prayer for us in the church. I really think that we're called to the extreme life as Christians. Because, you see, when we decided to say yes to Jesus, we've said no to just about everything else you can say yes to. When we make Jesus Lord and Savior, then everything else in the world is below. And that becomes the extreme high. You see, Jesus calls us to this extreme life, and, and part of what makes that happen is our prayers. You see, have you ever noticed that sometimes the church seems weak? You know? What, what's our mission, and what's our purpose? And, and what, 
and how well do we do it? And are we changing people's lives? And you know, it takes effort to change people's lives. It takes effort to be good examples. It takes effort to live life like Jesus called us to live. And that's because he's called us to the extreme life, which takes, repeat after me, extreme prayer. So, let's see here. How many of you know that the Bible has all kinds of promises for us? Do you know that the Bible has promises for us? Would you like to know just a few? Because I don't have time to tell you all of them. How about this? In the promises of Scripture, we're promised a new heart. I don't know about you, but that's kind of exciting. Ezekiel 36, 26 says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. That's a pretty cool promise. Scripture promises things like forgiveness. Any of you ever need to be forgiven? I'm not talking about just this minute, but maybe the person next to you. Listen to this Psalm 103 says, as far as the east is from the west, so far has God removed our transgressions from us. Wow. So we're, we're, we're promised a new heart. We're promised forgiveness. And here's one from Philippians 4.19. Paul writes, And my God shall supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. It is a promise to meet every single need we have every single need. So, so we've been promised a new heart. We've been promised forgiveness. We've been promised to have all of our needs met. And I really love that Jesus gets involved in making some promises for us. He promises to never leave us or forsake us. Oh, I am with you always, he says in the Gospel of Matthew, even until the very end of the age. He promises to bring us salvation. He promises to give us the Holy Spirit. And he promises over and over and over again to answer our prayers. Now, I know some of you are going, well, I prayed last night, and I haven't gotten the answer I wanted yet. I didn't say he's going to answer your prayers the way you want them. If you prayed to win the lottery, I'm sorry, I'm going to win first. <laughs> right? But I'll tie. I promise. At least four times in the Gospel of John, four times in the Gospel of John, Jesus says, whatever you ask in my name, I will do or give to you. Now, just so you know, it's not just the Gospel of John, but it's in Matthew 2 and in Mark 2. Luke seemed to leave that part out. But at least seven different times in Scripture, Jesus promises to answer our prayers with the saying, whatever you ask in my name, I will do for you. Wow. Whatever we ask. So what is this thing called prayer? Well, prayer is going to be a strategy. It's our strategy for life. If you really want to know the truth, prayer, prayer is the strategy that changes people's lives. How many of you have ever prayed for a friend or a neighbor? How many of you have ever prayed for somebody that you're not sure you like well enough to pray for, but somebody said you ought to pray for them anyway? Well, here's what I'm going to tell you. Prayer always, always, always changes at least two people. The one we're praying for, but more importantly, it, it changes us. 
So everybody repeat after me. Prayer changes me. Now, the reason that's important is because I know you all in this room are very likable. Everybody in the world loves you. You never have any conflict. You, I mean, not even in this room. We never have conflict, do we? And, and we, we never have, you know, here's what I'm going to tell you. And this is a side note, but you should write this down. When somebody is annoying the heck out of you, it's your fault. Pray for them. Pray that God will bless them. Pray that God will give them everything they need and everything their heart desires. Pray that they will be blessed. Pray again and again. Do you know why? Because it's hard to hate people we're praying for. It's true. Try it. You can't do it. If you are sincerely praying for people, your attitude towards them is going to change. And when your attitude towards them changes, guess what's going to happen? I promise their attitude towards you will change just as well. Think about that for a minute. You see, prayer is going to be our strategy. I love th this book called Extreme Prayer. You've heard, heard me say that we need to buy that book and read it and put it into practice. And, 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 and I said that because here's a guy. It's written by my friend Greg Pruitt. He's living in Africa, going to work every day. He's a Bible translator. He's changing people's lives. He's making a difference in, in a whole nation <laughs> understanding of Scripture. They've written a whole language for his people so they could have a Bible to read. You see, one of the things that we forget in America is that, you know, we all went to school, learned to read and read and write. And the language was already created. I have friends who are in the business of creating written languages for people who've never had a written language before. And then they put the Bible into that language. And then they gift the people with the Bible. There's some good news. By the year 2050, every spoken language in the world will have a copy of Scripture in their language. You see, sometimes we Americans take things for granted. How many Bibles do we have on our shelves, in our offices, and in our homes? And how many of us really want the preacher to call before he comes so you can dust them off. <laughs> you all are laughing. I haven't even been to most of your homes. <laughs> it's true, isn't it? <laughs> well, you should never tell me things like that because I might just show up. You see, four times Jesus in the Gospel of John says, whatever you ask. And, and we ask some of the most lame things of God. Now, sometimes we ask really serious things. We ask for people to be healed and for lives to be changed. But when's the last time we've asked for someone to receive the gift of salvation? When's the last time we've actually asked our government to be blessed by God? Not saved, blessed. There's a difference. You see... Prayer as a strategy is really important because when Greg Pruitt was in Africa, his company called and said,
said, hey, we, we, we've had this prayer experience, and, and we want you to come and be the new president of Pioneer Bible Translators. That's who we work for. And he said to them, I'm a Bible translator, not an administrator. They said, well, yes, but, but God told us you were the man. And he said, what do you mean? He says, well, the committee of seven met three weeks ago. And we went home. And we were told to pray and ask God to give us a name to be president of Pioneer Bible Translators. And he says, and we, we told each other not to talk to each other, but just to pray. And on, on the day before the meeting, write down the name that God gave me. And he says, so? And the guy says, every single person came to the second meeting with one name and one name only written on that page. And it was Greg Pruitt. And Greg says, who am I to argue with God? So they made him president. They moved him from Africa to Texas. And, and he went into his office and his secretary greeted him and said, it's so good to see you. And it's so great to have you as president. What are we going to do? And he said, in his brain, I haven't got a clue. <laughs> but to his secretary, he said, we're going to pray. And they set some lofty goals, none of which they could have met just on their own. They were going to double in six years their size, and they were going to become the premier Bible translation company in the world. And now that they've basically partnered with Wycliffe, they've done both of those things in less than six years. Prayer is a strategy, works, but we have to pray whatever kind of prayers. I think there's another one here. He says we need to pray active prayers. Now, some of you know the acronym for ACTS, to pray according to the ACTS, and, and, and that's in here, but it's not enough. He says, he says, first of all, we always need to be giving God glory. We need to be expressing adoration. And that is how we worship and how we prove that we love God. And, and part of that then is confession. And that's when we tell God about ourselves. And, you know, sometimes that's not, a, that's not a pretty thing, is it? Because sometimes we fall short and sometimes we sin and sometimes we hurt people's feelings. But God says, confess those and be forgiven and you will be forgiven. And so we, we praise God and we confess. And then, most importantly, after we've done confession, we need to give God thanks because, you know what? I'm going to tell you a great secret. God didn't have to forgive you. God doesn't have to bless us. God doesn't have to do anything because God's God, right? So when God does forgive us, we need to give thanksgiving. And then there's... You, you, in, in the Acts Center, it would say supplication, but in active, it's intercession. And this is where we pray for people's needs. We pray for the needs of the people next door to us. And we pray for the people who work for us and play with us and teach us. And, and I love the, the five-finger prayer thing that the children learn because it helps them to learn that we can intercede for anyone and everyone and they don't even need to know about it. I have a friend, her name's Sarah Almanza. She's the pastor of a church, and on Mondays and Tuesdays, oftentimes, I think she's bored because every once in a while on Facebook, it pops up, how can I pray for you today? What if we all approached life that way, thinking, how can we pray for you today? Would that change our lives? And I think it would. So. We, we praise God, we confess our sins, we give thanks, and we intercede for others. And then, here comes the tough one, we vanquish evil. Now, I, I know that we're a part of the 
Christian Church of Disciples of Christ. And some of our brothers and sisters, they, they, they would cringe at this because they don't really believe that there's evil out there. But there is. You can call it whatever you want. You can call it Satan. You can call it the devil. You can call it evil. You can make up a name. I don't care what you call it, but it's there. If you don't believe me, read the newspaper, watch the news. Walk outside. Evil is there. And sometimes it's aimed right at our most personal beings. Sometimes it's aimed at our very being. And so we need to work at vanquishing evil because it's all around us. And we vanquish evil, first of all, by praying prayers of protection. Praying prayers of protection for our leaders and our pastors and our elders and our deacons and our mayor and our fire department and our EMTs and, and praying that the world around us would be saved from the evil that abounds. And those aren't prayers of judgment. <coughs> It's really easy to look at the world and judge it by the evil. You, you know, the Pharisees used to have a prayer. They would say, Lord, thank you that I am not that person over there. As they look down their nose at the person over there. We live in a world where children are going hungry and people are dying alone and not going to heaven because we haven't told them. We need to vanquish evil. It's all around us and sometimes it's right within us. And then we need to pray for anything. When I was in eighth grade, maybe seventh grade, an amazing thing happened in my life. First of all, I went to camp and got saved and got baptized and all of that. Not too long after that, our family woke up one Sunday morning and my father was dressed in a suit. Now you have to understand something. My father didn't usually go to church with us. In fact, we had rules in our house. We could all go to church, but dinner on Sunday was at 12.30. Which wasn't too bad, except at that point we lived 16 miles from the church. But my dad came out of the bedroom in his suit, and we thought somebody had died. Because that's when my father wore a suit. <coughs> and he says, no, nope, I'm going to church with you today. Basically, we went, hmm. And so we all six clambered into our 1964 Ford pickup truck. There were six of us in the cab. We liked each other. Cabs were bigger back then, it's true. But I wasn't much smaller than I am now. My father is bigger, and I had an older brother. Like I said, we liked each other, sort of. And off we went to church. Had a great day, came home. The next Sunday, Dad shows up in a suit again. Different tie. He owned three ties. They all match the same suit. Not like me, I have a different time for everything. And we watched astoundedly as Pastor Jack offered the invitation. And my father, from the third pew, got up and gave his life to Jesus. I 
was not very old. I was kind of a smart aleck, but I knew that it was sort of a special day, so I kept my mouth shut. <laughs> and Dad went with Jack after making the good confession to the back so he could be greeted and welcomed into the family of God. And I was one of the first people out, and I patted him on the shoulder, and I said, see you down in the fellowship hall, that's where the food is. <laughs> on my way to the fellowship hall, one of the elders of that church, Bernie, was his name, came up and put his arm around me, and he said, you may or may not know this, but this is a day that most of us never believed would happen. He said, some of us have been praying for your father for 20 years. The longer I've thought about that story, the more I have appreciated it because of the one thing he said that should disturb us to no end. For years, some of them had been praying for my father, believing that it was a day that would never happen. An extreme prayer says, even the things we can't in our brains get a hold of, even the things in our mind that we can't wrap our mind around are possible when we pray in Jesus' name. For Jesus says, whatever. we're going to explore what that really means. But today I ask you, who and what are you going to pray for this week? shepherd lead us because I believe that our prayer lives are led by the Savior. And we're going to sing the first and the last verse. So, and it's him, I don't even really know what hymn and number it is in the book, but it's on the screen. If you need to give your life to Jesus, we invite you to do that today. It's 601. If you want to make First Christian Church your church home and you need one and want to transfer here, we would invite you to do that by Either of those things by coming forward as we stand together and say, save your life. Shut up. Thank you.